They contain 40% of the world's fresh water. The tallest mountains on Earth, home to 55,000 glaciers, source to seven of Asia's greatest rivers. But our most precious resource is disappearing one drop at a time. What's happening in the Himalayan glaciers is incredibly complex. Most glaciers appear to be melting. The people of Asia face an uncertain future. From Nepal to the Tibetan Plateau, Bhutan to India and the Bay of Bengal, their way of life is under threat. The climate is changing, and life as we know it, from the mountains to sea, is falling out of balance. Glacial lakes reach critical capacity and burst. Droughts threaten once lush farmlands. Weather patterns become unpredictable. Thousands of miles downstream, sea levels rise, forcing coastal villagers from their farmlands and into crowded inner cities. I think we had never a phenomenon where what is happening in the glaciers and in the downstream area is so closely linked. The Himalayas are the water towers of Asia. When the water tower dries out and two billion people don't have water to drink anymore, to irrigate their farms, to run industry, then there's going to be serious problems. This is going to change the entire eco-balance of at least nine or ten major river systems. There's a question about whether we're going through a period of global warming, and I don't think it's important. What is important is that the environment is changing, that climate is changing. This is a wake-up call, and we still have time to do something about it. We just need to hear this alarm. The people of Asia are answering the call, harnessing determination, spirituality, and science to adapt and survive in the face of a Himalayan meltdown. The mountain glaciers that sit high in the Himalayas are the lifeblood of Asia. The glaciers span an enormous geographic region. From Pakistan through India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh and China. They are the source of water for some of the world's great rivers. The Indus, Ganges, Mekong, Yangtze and Yellow Rivers all flow from the Himalayan mountains to the seas of Asia. The close link between mountain and sea is readily apparent when you stand on Mount Everest, the world's highest peak. <laughs> While summiting Mount Everest for the second time, mountaineer Dava Stephen Sherpa realized that the ice and glaciers were disappearing right before his eyes. This is a treasure for us but it is also a vital necessity for billions of people who depend upon these glaciers for water. When I first climbed in 2007, I saw firsthand myself how badly the ice was melting. Um, the glaciers were melting, the seracs were melting, the slopes were melting, so causing more avalanches, more rock falls. Something has to be done about it because billions of people all around the Himalayas are facing danger as their very vital source of water slowly disappears. When mountaineers first explored the Himalayas, their photos showed spectacular glacial fields. Austrian cartographer Erwin Schneider was among the first of the so-called climber scientists. His photos are not only a window to the past, but are also an important tool for scientists who are studying the glaciers today. Uh, look over there, see the photo point? Almost 60 years after Schneider captured these stunning images, Dr. Alton Byers has returned to precisely the same photo points to document changes in the glaciers. 
When you look at the photographs of Himalayan glaciers taken in the 1920s and compare those with photographs taken in the 1950s and then compare those with the ones that I've taken recently, the changes are both dramatic as well as compelling. Nowhere is the change more dramatic than Nepal's Khumbu Valley, which leads to Mount Everest. Schneider's 1953 photo of the valley shows ice fields as low as 4,000 meters. When paired with the contemporary photograph, you can see greatly diminished glacial fields. Even more troubling is the formation of a massive glacial lake formed from the glacier's meltwater. The photo comparisons tell us what scientists already know that 65% of the Himalayan glaciers are receding. People may dispute the causes of climate change, but there's clearly no dispute that climate change is happening, and there's no better indicator to illustrate this than glaciers. It's going to mean change. It's going to mean changes in water supply. It'll be changes in weather patterns, and people are going to have to think much more seriously about adaptation. The dramatic change in climate, rainfall patterns, and the glaciers are forcing mountain communities throughout the Himalayas to adapt. Here in Nepal's Khumbu Valley, thousands of trekkers make their way through the tiny villages, largely unaware of these dramatic shifts in the environment. The people of Dingbo She, however, know better. The village sits at 3,900 meters and is just a two days hike from the Mount Everest base camp. Sonam Ishi Sherpa runs a small hotel and has lived beneath towering Everest for his entire life. He has seen many changes, but one in particular keeps him awake at night. Lake Imja lies just above Dingboche and while it might appear to be a beautiful sight to the trekkers, it is a constant reminder to villagers of a potential disaster. I remember when Imja Lake was very small, but it keeps growing every year, and I'm very afraid that it will burst. Dingboche's location along the river puts it squarely in the path of a massive wall of water if this earthen dam breaks apart. In Kathmandu, computer models at the International Center for Mountain Development are alerting scientists to a disturbing increase in the number of potentially deadly glacial lakes like Imja. People are very much worried about those lakes and they don't know when and how it will breach out. It will destroy their valleys, villages, and infrastructure, settlement, and people and other cattle will be washed away. Imja is surrounded by peaks as high as 8,000 meters. Avalanches and earthquakes are common here, and the force from either could send a shockwave through Lake Imja, causing a glacial lake outburst flood. And this will bring down the huge debris, like the debris size of 20 meter boulders, 50 meter boulders sometimes, and a lot of silt and sands and all this mud coming down. It will just cover the land and you cannot recover it for generations. People lost their livelihood forever sometime. I'm not worried so much about myself. I've survived the glove before, but I'm scared for my community. All of the settlements around here are along the riverbed. A glacial flood would devastate the entire river valley. Before 1960, Imja Lake did not exist. But today it is filled with water from the melting glacier. It is just over 100 meters deep and two kilometers long. Just one of thousands of recently formed lakes spread throughout the Himalayas. We mapped the glacial lake of the whole Himalaya, right from Amudari Basin in Afghanistan to the Irrawaddy Basin in Myanmar. 
we have mapped slightly more than 20,000 glacial lakes, and out of it, 200, we need a special attention at the moment. Nepal's largest lake created by meltwater is Sovropa. Like Imja, it is an alarming new body of water that is a growing threat to the safety of downstream villagers. <laughs> Glaciologist Koji Fujita of Japan's Nagoya University hopes that science can provide a solution. He and his research team are gathering scientific data that may lead to answers about the glaciers and perhaps replace fear with information. Through our research, we hope to determine how much water is stored in these glaciers. Because if you know how much water is available and how fast the glacier is retreating, you can plan for the future. It's a lot like knowing how much money you have in the bank. Obtaining information about the health of the glaciers is not easy. Fujita's team is placing remote sensors on Soropa that will provide data that can be analyzed by scientists all over the world. We need to measure, we need to monitor, we need to model. And we need to understand what is happening to the Himalayan glacier, what is happening to the health of the Himalayan glacier. But we don't have to wait for perfect science in order to prepare people. Climate change is not only creating a perilous surplus of water, it is bringing drought conditions. Many mountain communities have seen the seasonal monsoon rains all but disappear. And with nearby glacial meltwater drying up, one village is harnessing something that is in ample supply here. The heavy fog surrounding Elam, Nepal, contains more than enough drinking water for 3,000 villagers during the dry months. To convert the fog into water, the people of Elam use a series of inexpensive mesh nets to trap the moisture from the fog. As the moisture soaks into the nets, water begins to trickle into a basin. Gravity then carries the fresh water to convenient spigots located throughout the village, saving the people of Elam a two-hour trek to the nearest river. The fog-catching nets are just one of many solutions, helping over 200 million Asian citizens adapt to the Himalayan meltdown. The Kingdom of Bhutan lies at the southern tip of the Tibetan Plateau. Until the 1970s, the borders of this Buddhist country were closed to outsiders, helping to preserve their traditions amid the swirl of a modern and industrialized world. For centuries, the Bhutanese, like their Tibetan and Nepalese neighbors, have lived off the land. Farmers and herders are all sustained by the glacial waters, which the locals refer to as white gold. Bhutan, like most other countries within the Hindu Kush region, is harnessing the meltwater to create hydroelectricity, which generates much needed energy and revenue for the kingdom. But the very same glacial meltwater that sustains the kingdom is threatening to destroy the villages and farmlands that line its rivers. The Himalayan meltdown is creating hundreds of high-altitude lakes which contain massive amounts of water. At any moment, an earthquake or avalanche could trigger a glacial lake outburst flood, obliterating all in its path. It is among the most feared natural disasters throughout the Himalayas. This rare footage shows a glacial lake outburst flood ripping through the village of Punaha in 1994. 21 people died, 
a year's worth of crops destroyed. I lived here when the lake burst in 1994. I saw people picked up by the water and carried away. Yaks and horses were washed away. Even today, I don't like to go near the river because I'm very afraid of another glove happening. Karma lives with her elderly mother and one daughter, just meters from the edge of the Fo Chu River. She was born here and narrowly survived the 1994 glacial flood. She lives in constant fear that another may strike. When it comes to myself, I may be able to run away. But I worry for my elderly relatives who may not be able to escape immediately. The 1994 Glof originated high in the mountains, where the glacial lakes are rising at an alarming rate. There are more than 2,600 glacial lakes in Bhutan. This one, just above the village of Lunana, is among the most dangerous. Lake Tortomi is now a moonscape of rocks, sand and mud, and is gradually filling with meltwater. By contrast, the adjacent Lake Rapstring is a fully formed lake 100 meters deep. Separating the two is an unstable 35 meter moraine wall of sediment deposited by the melting glacier. As lake levels rise from the melting glaciers, so does the pressure on this precarious dam. If Lake Tortomi ultimately overtops the earthen wall, a superglacial lake with 53 million cubic meters of water could burst, causing a flood three times the size of the one in 1994. Like during 1994 Glove, when 18 million cubic meters of water was released, now you are talking about 53 million cubic meters of water to be released if the worst case scenario occurs in the future. As a matter of national urgency, the Bhutanese government with assistance from an international climate change adaptation fund that was established by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and partner organizations such as the United Nations Development Program, the Global Environment Facility, the World Wildlife Fund and the Government of Austria has launched an ambitious project to prevent another disaster. The fight to save their country from a glacial flood begins promptly at 7.45 a.m. at this base camp near Lake Tortomi. 350 men and women have traveled nine days through treacherous mountains for the opportunity to work on one of the kingdom's most important and ambitious projects. Because of the high altitude and the risk of avalanches, heavy machines cannot be used, so workers are equipped with only hand tools. They work with a sense of urgency to remove boulders and debris. They are in a race against time to clear a channel that they hope will drain Lake Tortomi by five meters. Basically in here we are talking about the hydrostatic pressure that is built as the ice starts to melt and then the water level rises. So basically we are releasing the pressure. We'll try to remove all the soil and then now we are, we are going to let out the water from there. Lake Tortomi sits at 4,300 meters. The air is thin and the work is dangerous and difficult. You, you can very well see over here that, you know, the, we have to work with the, these big, big boulders which are very loose. The water is very, very cold, maybe one to two degrees centigrade. Here, the quest to contain the Himalayan meltdown provides economic opportunity for stalwart laborers. It is well worth the effort for workers like Shem Doji Doya, who trekked 14 days in the hopes of making enough money to start a new life. 
With the money that I earn from working here, I plan to open a small store so that I can support my family. This worker, who has a single name of Zam, says although the work is hard, she is grateful to have a job. I came from across Bhutan. My husband passed away quite a while ago, but this is the first time that I have been able to support my family. I'm so grateful to have this job. To implement such kind of project in such kind of places like Lonana at this altitude is very, very difficult. Project planners struggle to supply the workforce with food and tools in this remote and rugged location. In addition to the 300 workers at Tortomi, another 200 local herdsmen were employed to transport the 60 tons of supplies to the site. The team considered using helicopters, but the terrain and unpredictable weather made it impossible. Using skilled yak and horse herders was not only more reliable, but provided significant social and economic benefits. Saring Geltsen and his team of horses have carried 106 loads of supplies from the town of Gaza to Lake Tortomi. Like many horsemen, he has no formal education. I'm very happy. With this money, I will buy another horse so that I can make even more money. He has returned home after an entire summer of leading his horses to the project site. The money will sustain Geltsen's family for an entire year. The money that the horsemen and women have earned during the three-year project will buy food, shelter and education for their children. It may also buy something else for their country. Precious time to prevent a deadly glacial flood. A very important project for Bhutan, not only for our department, it's for the country. If my project succeeds, uh, the life of humans are saved, so that is a pride which I have. The Bhutanese are now installing early warning systems along the rivers, ensuring that both its people and critical infrastructure are prepared for a glacial flood. In the Himalayas, I think uh, this is the first time that uh, such work is being done, and then uh, quite a lot of the countries like uh, Nepal, Pakistan, India, they are all observing us how we are doing and how successful we will be. Next summer, the Lunana Bell will once again call the workers to one of the most challenging climate-changing adaptation projects in the world. This bell is also a call to action for Bhutan and a signal to the world of what can be accomplished when a committed nation adapts to the Himalayan meltdown. Nowhere is water more critical than in the arid, high desert mountain communities throughout the Hindu Kush. The village of Leh sits at 3,500 meters in northern India. The windswept area is all too familiar with the unpredictable hazards that come with the Himalayan meltdown. It is a world of extremes. Floods, mudslides and droughts besiege this area mercilessly. Glaciers are receding and weather patterns are shifting unpredictably. Rainfall is failing or when rainfall comes there is flooding. There's a lot of extreme events taking place with alarming frequency. So people are worried. August 2010. A cloudburst erupts over Ley sending a wall of mud and water through the city in the middle of the night. By daybreak, 179 people were dead, including the sister of 12-year-old Skalzan Gagmo. The mud and water swept into our house. It pushed my mother and me outside. 
I called out to my sister and tried to grab her, but she slipped through my fingers. It was the last time I saw her. The devastating cycle of flood and drought is all too common throughout the entire region. The changing precipitation patterns, I think, are the most dramatic aspect. More intensive precipitation, more concentrated, then we have more extended periods of drought. So the predictability has changed dramatically. 75-year-old Chuang Norfell remembers a time when the weather was more predictable and the glaciers were visible. People are very worried about the vanishing glaciers. Farmers fear they might have to migrate one day. An example of the rapidly retreating glaciers is the Kar Dungla glacier. I remember when we could actually walk on the glacier, but now there is not even a single trace of ice. It's an obvious sign of climate change. Lay receives only three inches of rain per year, and farmers rely heavily on the glacial meltwater to irrigate their crops in the spring. But with the low altitude glaciers gone, it is early summer before water flows from the higher altitudes. Too late for the local farmers. An engineer by trade, Norfell wondered how he could help the farmers of Ley. His solution? To manipulate nature into forming artificial glaciers. During the fall season, Norfell builds large ponds on the side of the mountain that will receive little sunlight in the upcoming winter months. As winter approaches, he diverts stream water from the high-altitude glaciers into the man-made ponds where it is shielded from the sun's heat. As winter snows begin to accumulate, Norfell's strategically placed ponds begin to freeze. Here, the artificial glaciers can remain frozen throughout the winter months. It's like a giant ice cube that contains enough water to irrigate 200 hectares of crops. Norfell's creative engineering has now replaced what nature can no longer provide. By spring, the artificial glaciers begin to thaw releasing precious water to the farmers below. It is now the harvest season, and Norfell pays a visit to the farmers of Stakmo. They are reaping the bounty of a bumper crop of barley. I was extremely happy today when I saw farmers harvesting the crops that I helped them to grow. It gives me great satisfaction that my hard work is turning out to be fruitful. We grow the best barley in the world. It is our life source, but our crops cannot exist without water. Mr. Norfell first built the artificial glacier as an experiment. When it actually worked, word spread among the villagers. Sonam Dacian and his family are harvesting their best potato crop in years because of the water supplied by the artificial glaciers. But he admits that the idea seemed odd at first. When Mr. Norfell first attempted to build the artificial glacier, we thought he was crazy. But once we started getting water from it, then we believed him. Now, we are very grateful to Mr. Norfell. We will not be able to survive without the water from Norfell's glaciers. We are farmers and we depend on our crops. There are no other job options for us. Norfell has become famous in his native Ladakh and is affectionately known as the Iceman. Each artificial glacier only costs 7,000 US dollars and more than a dozen have been built. Costs are kept low because they use locally found materials and the villagers help build them. <laughs> I'm very proud to be working on the artificial glacier. Water is very precious to farmers like us. Now we can grow more crops and I can provide more for my children. I want the villagers to be capable of building artificial glaciers on their own so they can be more independent. 
If they need repairing or a new one needs to be built, they can do it without me. Buoyed by his success with the region's farmers, Norfell has turned his attention to creating reservoirs of drinking water for local villagers. This is Norfell's latest creation, a man-made reservoir that will provide water for this drought-stricken region. Soon, water will be delivered directly to 100 families, ending their daily commute to local streams. When Norfell gazes across the valley, where he has lived for 75 years, he is grateful that he has made a difference in the lives of his fellow villagers. I know that I am only one person and I cannot stop climate change alone. But I am very hopeful that if we dedicate ourselves to adaptive solutions like creating artificial glaciers, this will lessen the worries of the people. Because of the ingenuity and dedication of the Iceman, the people of the Ladakh region are able to see a future where water still flows from the mountains a future of bountiful crops grown on family farms. Bangladesh isn't often associated with the towering Himalayan mountains. With an average elevation of just 10 meters above sea level, it's mostly known as a country of rivers. Bangladesh is a country of waters. People's life and livelihood is synchronized with the climatic seasons and their river. The rivers are its economic heart, but the Himalayan meltdown that is taking place thousands of miles away is having serious repercussions on Bangladesh's rivers and its people. Bangladesh is, you know, the classic uh, climate change victim. It's being hit for, at both ends, so to speak. It's being hit by the ice melt, and then it's being hit by the rising sea levels. Despite Bangladesh's relatively low carbon footprint, the effects of climate change are having a dramatic effect on its 150 million citizens. Increased flooding and droughts, cyclones and erosion, are washing away their income and food security. This is a, a challenge for the country because it's a crisis. Bangladesh become one of the most vulnerable countries. 56 major river systems, including the Ganges, Brahmaputra and Meghna, originate in the Himalayas, coursing their way through Bangladesh, carrying sediment and meltwater. As glacial runoff flows from the Himalayas to the Bay of Bengal, the increased volume and velocity of the water becomes an insidious destructive force. Riverbanks collapse and once productive farmland is swallowed up. Siraj Ganji is one of hundreds of villages that line the country's rivers. As long as they have land, they can raise livestock, grow their own food, and provide for themselves. But their way of life is literally eroding away. From here to up to one kilometer away, there is land and there are lots of houses. People have cattle, people have vegetable field. Everything has eroded in only just last three months. I lost it all, my farm and all my belongings. The river destroyed it all. I'm moving to the other side of the river. Maybe it'll be safer over there. The rising river will swallow this building in less than one week. Entire settlements vanish in a matter of days and people are forced to migrate elsewhere. The residents of Siraj Ganji are busy disassembling their homes and businesses before the river claims them. The effects of the Himalayan meltdown are forcing thousands of people to flee their farms in the countryside to the crowded inner city of Dhaka. 
they struggle to make a new life amid the chaos of one of the world's most populated cities. 40-year-old Mosheda Begum remembers a time when she and her husband could live off the land. My husband is sick and cannot work, so I must sew hand scarves to earn money. A life in the country was hard, but we did not have a landlord and could provide for ourselves. Now our rent is half of our monthly income. Life is very hard in the slums. Six months ago, 60-year-old Mahmoud Haider was a farmer. Today, he is one of the thousands of rickshaw drivers eking out a living in Dhaka. I came to work in Dhaka because my land was flooded. I had no other choice. Ironically, the same mountain-fed rivers that are causing the erosion also carry tons of sediment that can help people stay on their land. <laughs> Along Bangladesh's rivers, people are adapting to the erosion by reclaiming the river sediment and creating higher ground, one bucket at a time. It's a race against the river, but one that these people hope they will win, so that they can continue to provide for themselves. Other communities are building mounds made from river mud that will soon support crops and fruit trees. While collecting silt from the rivers is helpful for inland communities, solving the erosion problems along Bangladesh's vast coastline requires a different type of solution. Kukri Makri is an island community of 4,500 families accustomed to cyclones and monsoon floods. But now they have the added burden of increased river flow from the glaciers and rising sea levels. Coastal area is the most vulnerable areas in Bangladesh. And if there is vegetative shelter belt, there would be minimum flow of water during tidal surges. The forest will protect it. At low tide, the solution to the island's erosion problems is visible. These are the roots of mangrove trees, which are native to the coastal area. The muddy delta is an ideal habitat for the trees. Their roots act like giant nets, catching the sediment from the river and holding it in place. The more trees there are, the more soil stays attached to the island. But there are not enough trees to ensure the island's long-term safety, so they are growing more of them. The United Nations Development Program, with financing from the Least Developed Countries Fund of the United Nations Climate Change Convention, is supporting an innovative coastal afforestation program. This program is designed to counter effects of sea level rise while maintaining the sensitive ecosystem and creating economic opportunities for coastal communities. Nearly everyone on the island is involved in the project. The nurseries are tended to daily by the very people who will benefit from the trees. More than two million new mangrove trees are being cultivated from seedlings, each one under the tender care of the islanders. These workers are preparing a field for planting a new batch of seedlings. They work with a sense of urgency. Without the mangrove roots, the land would likely be engulfed by the river during the next flood or cyclone. Sherman Acasta is a mother of three. She was born on Kukri Makri, and her home sits among the mangrove trees. She understands the connection between the forest's survival and her children's well-being. The trees are the life of our community. There is no embankment here along the river. So when the tidal flow comes, these trees will protect us. If the trees did not exist, my family would have to move to the city. Life along the coast would be totally impossible without the trees. We have conducted a number of project awareness meetings at Chaur Kukri Mukri. 
In the meeting, the local communities told me that they will never cut the forest because forest is saving them from all types of natural calamities. The roots of the mangrove trees hold together not only the soil and sediment of Bangladesh, they enable millions of Bengalis living along the riverbanks to stay rooted in their communities. China, one of the most notable emerging economies on the planet. A global manufacturing and economic powerhouse. The Himalayas feed the Yellow, the Yangtze, and other rivers that weave through China's vast territories, fueling its vibrant expansion. While commerce has transformed life in the urban city, here on the rural Tibetan plateau, life remains much the same as it was centuries ago. But for nomadic herdsmen like Tsering Dorja, it is a way of life that is quickly disappearing, along with the glaciers. The glaciers are retreating, and the water level in rivers is dropping too. Grass is not growing as well as before. Many female yaks used to have calves every year. Now, some don't even give birth for years. The once fertile plains that his yaks feed upon are drying up. Grasslands are becoming deserts. The yak and sheep herds are half the size they were just a few years ago. For the indigenous people of the Tibetan Plateau, disappearing glacier-fed rivers are threatening an ancient way of life. China's leading climatologist Yao Tandong estimates that the glaciers that feed the Yangtze, Yellow, Mekong and Brahmaputra rivers have shrunk 7% over the past 40 years and the rate is accelerating. When these glaciers are melting, it means that the water in form of capital is diminishing. We are living on the capital of the next generation also. Climate change is only one factor contributing to the Himalayan meltdown. Thousands of kilometers from the Tibetan plateau, soot or black carbon gets into the air and is blown across Asia into the Himalayas. There it is deposited on the continent's glaciers. Instead of reflecting the sun's heat as they once did, the glaciers are now absorbing it. Black carbon is a factor which is contributing substantially to glacier and ice melting. We need to understand what is happening in our ecosystems much better. All of us must move on the path of a low carbon footprint. China and India have begun to address the problem. Though these developing economies contribute to growing carbon emissions, they are striving towards solutions. China now produces and uses more renewable energy than any country in the world. On the streets of New Delhi, Beijing and Shanghai, government policies promote the use of clean-burning compressed natural gas vehicles. Finding ways to reduce our carbon footprint and adapt to nature's changing climate is a shared and urgent challenge. Throughout Asia, people are awakening to the deep connection that exists between their actions and the climate. Do we still have the link between ablation and... Not surprisingly, the citizens, scientists and governments of Asia are discovering a common purpose, discovering a new sense of cooperation. As individual institutions, our resources are limited. But through international institutions like ICMOD, we can pool our resources and help each other. So international cooperation is very important. 
We need to bring about greater regional cooperation, uh, simply because ecosystems don't recognize geographical boundaries. From the valley fields of India to the mangrove forests of Bangladesh, in the mountains of Nepal and Bhutan, and on the Tibetan plateau, people are awakening to the parallel between the environment and their survival. If we allow that environment to be destroyed, the human species will go away. For the next generation, I'm not so optimistic unless there are dramatic changes. We've actually destroyed our planet without even thinking about it. So think about what we can achieve if we actually get together and focus our energy on protecting our environment. Mahatma Gandhi said, you have to be the change agent that you want to preach. We want less talk and more action. More than anything else, it will require political will for people to come together and start addressing this issue. Indeed, change has come to the Himalayan glaciers. And now it is up to the people and governments of Asia to adapt to these changes. The manner in which they adapt is as diverse as the millions of people who inhabit the region. From the towering heights of the Himalayas to the coastal lowlands, solutions will be found. Some will find answers through research and the sharing of information. Many will rise to the challenge with physical determination and the sweat of their brow. Yet others will seek spiritual guidance. No matter how they choose to adapt to the Himalayan meltdown, the citizens and governments of Asia must recognize that climate change doesn't stop at borders. From the mountains to sea, we must adapt to the changes if we are to survive.